Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Vocast. I'm your host, Drew. We've got yet another special guest with us today, Mr. Peter Barber. We've the uh, one. <laughs> we we all know him mostly from YouTube, but we also know him as a quarter of the uh bass gang. We also know him as a professional opera singer. And um, what other music involvement do you have? So what else do you do? Yeah, so the uh, the main career, the day job is professional opera singer um, at the Academy of Vocal Arts in Philadelphia currently, among other places. Um, the secondary career has become YouTube. So started off just with doing acapella covers and other musical covers. Then I kind of moved into the reaction and kind of made a, my own genre of the reactions doing pretty in-depth musical analysis, which people have come to know. And then thirdly has become being, yeah, one of the four members of the bass gang, which has continued to grow beyond what we originally expected. So those are kind of the main three things I do. Yeah. So, and as you've guys, if you've guys not heard of Peter yet, he is a phenomenal singer and he's a phenomenal YouTuber. So we're going to dive in today and we're going to learn more about him. So, uh, Without further ado, let's jump right into the uh, traditional questions. You ready to get hammered? Yeah, let's, <laughs> always. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So we start off with a really light one. What's your favorite or preferred drink? Any drink? Any drink. Alcoholic, non-alcoholic, oh hot, God. warm, cold. <laughs> Ooh, uh, probably, honestly, probably black like black coffee hot in the morning is probably number one. Okay. So I'm glad that someone else has finally said that because yeah. I'm on the, I'm on the black coffee train. Yeah. And you know, I actually don't drink that much coffee or caffeine. I, I limit it to the morning, but I mean, there's nothing like that cup of black Joe in the morning. It's unbeatable. Dude. No, you can't beat that either too. What's your, what's some of your favorite blends, any blends or brands or anything that stick out? Oh, you know, I pretty much, I always try to pick something new whenever I pick up. So I'll get whole bean and I'll grind it. I have a little uh, coffee bean grinder and then just do drip coffee. Um, yeah. Right now I've got a Starbucks blend from Columbia. That's super, super tasty. One of my favorites I've had in a while. Um, I also yeah. like, I also like Pete's coffee. Um, not because it sounds like, my <laughs> name, but I think it's actually a really, a really good brand. Um, yeah. Pete, Pete's house blend. Um, yeah, you know, I don't really remember that many off the top of my head. I pretty much just like, as long as it's not trash quality, I pretty much enjoy it. I've st I've come to like um, Black Rifle Coffee lately. Oh, I've thought about trying that. Yeah, I've they about they have some at the local Walmart, and I have tr I don't know what even what sub brand it's called under Black Rifle, but it's some of my favorite. You have to try them out if yep, they're at Walmart. Is that a strong brand of coffee. Uh, they have a mix of everything. They've got light, mediums, and they've got darks. Okay. I decided to try a uh, medium, and so far I like it. It's on the stronger side, but it's really flavorful. <laughs> yeah, I so, I, I'm also a fan of the dark coffee. I think you'll like it, then. but uh, yeah, yeah. so <laughs> we're going to get into some uh, little more music-y questions. So here's a good one. Um, this is very convoluted for some people. How did you get into music and or singing? Oh, my God. How much time do we have? <laughs> we have as much time as you've got. I'll, I'll try to give the elevator pitch. But um, <laughs> well, I've been singing ever since I was a kid. But then it was pretty much always just singing along to Disney movies or like rapping Eminem or whatever. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. I didn't formally do music until middle school where I played the trombone. And then in what? high school... Yeah, play the trombone. Uh, six, Bro, six through hold, nine hold on just a second. I got something cool to show you. Oh, shit. Look at this. No way. A yeah. Bonus. Look at that. No kidding, man. So you still play now. <laughs> I have not played this thing in, well, in several months. I haven't, I haven't played in a decade and a half. <laughs> oh my gosh, dude. That's so yeah, cool. That's kind of where my formal music started. Um, and then in high school, um, I was in a jazz singing group. Actually, my mom kind of pushed me towards it. Um, and one of the singers in that group is actually like a, like one of the most successful jazz singers in the world right now. Her name is Veronica Swift. 
Um, Veronica, I've heard that name. Yeah, good good friend of mine. Um, we were in that group together. And then I did choir my senior year. Again, my mom encouraged me to audition for like a regional choir. I'm always very musical, a lot of music in my family, but I was all about sports. I only gave a shit about sports in high school. Yeah. So like I wanted to go to college to play sports. And I, right before my senior year of high school, my mom encouraged me to take some classical voice lessons because she's like, you know, she was in the classical world as a cellist and she noticed my voice was like, basically just more resonant and lower than most people. And so she thought maybe opera would be a thing. I uh, ended up getting better offers for music than I did for sports. So I went to University of Miami for a couple of years, um, actually kind of turned away from opera because it was really overwhelming, got more, much more into music production, produced a ton of electronic music and other studio stuff. Yeah. And then uh, finished my undergrad at a different school and kind of right at the end of my undergrad, pivoted back to opera, singing this role called Don Alfonso and Mozart's Così Fan Tutte. And that kind of like turned me back onto it. So I had all these plans to go to grad school uh, for either composition or for music production or just to go freelancing as a DJ, basically, and produce electronic music. Yeah. Uh, that turned me back to opera, ended up getting a full ride and a teaching assistantship out at University of Southern California for, for vocal arts, for voice. Wow. Um, and then once I did that, that had really set me down to <laughs> like, okay, opera is now the main focus. And it has been since. So about what age were you when you realized that opera was your thing? 24. 24. And you're yeah, how I mean, old now? Uh, 29. Oh, wow. Yeah. So definitely not when I first got to my undergrad when I was 18 or 19. I definitely, I had no idea what was going on. I was like, this probably won't be my career. I don't know what I'm going to do. So 24, yeah. when I pivoted back and decided that's what I wanted to do in my master's, that's when I was like, okay, opera, opera is the move. Yeah, definitely. Something else, I'll have to ask you more about opera later because I've always wanted to know more about it. And now that I've got a professional opera singer here with us, it'd be a wonderful way to do so. It's a hell of a rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely seems like mm -hmm. it. I'm going to have to turn my mic down a little bit. I'm clipping it. Let's see. Okay, so, um, oh man, golly, I'm just doing all kinds of unprofessional stuff today. <laughs> I mean, this is like one episode three. I mean, this is yeah, like... yeah. You would figure I would have nailed it by now. <laughs> no, no, you'll 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 get you'll get the swing of it. I think I did. I'm... I did. I I used to have a podcast, and then I got way too busy and had to drop it, unfortunately. But it was yeah. I got through like ten or eleven episodes, and I remember the last few were like very comfy. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so some, who are some of the most influential figures, both in your life, as well as your musical career? Um, in life for sure. My dad, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a big hero of mine. There he is. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I have always have that poster. Uh, met him by the way. Oh, um, really? That's yeah, cool. Meet him. That was super cool. Um, in terms of opera, um, my favorite singers are Samuel Raimi. I also have a poster of him right over there. And Cesare Sieppi. I think they're the two, they're my two favorite bass opera singers of all time. Um, outside of opera, I remember like when I was super into choral music, still am, just don't do it as much. Eric Whitaker, absolutely loved him. Um, influences totally outside of the classical genre. I mean, Eminem is one of my favorite artists of all time. Red Hot Chili Peppers, Queen. Elton oh, the Trump, classics. Panic at the Disco. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, ton, tons of, like, tons of groups. I, in fact, when I'm not studying opera, I'm always listening to non-opera music. <laughs> I, get, I get plenty of opera during the day. So whenever yeah. I'm home or walking to AVA, and back, AVA is the name of the institution, yeah. never listening to opera unless I'm desperate to, like, memorize something. <laughs> um, and I, I think that the super diverse background has really informed my analysis videos. If you've seen them, being able to comment on something from a dubstep perspective or from a choral perspective or an opera perspective. I think I've noticed helps, that it helps kind of synthesize all these genres. I've always been a faithful follower of your reaction videos and I've oh, noticed cool. that. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Good, good. Glad it comes across. <laughs> <coughs> Golly, I just right into the mic. Backing up along, you got a cough drop or something? Oh man, you know I do, I, but um, we done started now. <laughs> uh, Brains left the station. 
Yeah, that's for sure. That ship has sailed. Yeah. Um, if you've got any closer, like closer influential figures, uh, what is something one of these influential figures has said that has stuck with you throughout your entire life? I'll go with my dad. Um, something he says that he's he's good at following this mentality, and it's a mentality that's easy to say but difficult to follow, is you want to be fully committed to whatever you're doing to accomplish your goals, but you don't want to be too attached to the outcome. So basically, like, work as hard as you can, but try to accept whatever happens from that. I've, I've always heard the um, being committed to something, but I didn't ever really like hear that second part. So that's a nice, that's a nice way to think of it. It, it is. It's a, it's a, it's a much healthier approach to yeah. accomplishing goals. Yeah, that's for sure. I need to keep that in mind. Yeah, I know. Oh, I, I do see. too. I mean, I'm honestly dog shit at it, but I try to, <laughs> I try to do it. <laughs> I Lord knows I am. <laughs> so, um, what are a few things that some people may not know about you? This can, you can take this and run with it, whatever direction you want. Most people who know me as an opera singer definitely don't know that I'm a dubstep producer. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I saw you mentioned that the, uh, the disco, the disco work and the, or I'm sorry, the DJ work. Yeah. Yeah. I was, a, I was a DJing professionally some back in undergrad. I mean, that's what I wanted to do for a while is be a festival DJ, like produce my own music, but then go perform as a DJ at like big music festivals. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I've produced a ton of electronic music. So that that's always one where people are like, because I dubstep and opera. I mean, like we're talking about the, basically one of the oldest art forms still happening or oldest musical art forms still happening with like yeah. you know, the newest, basically. Right. Um, so people people don't expect that much. Definitely one foot in the old, one foot in the new. Um, nowadays, because I advertise it much less, uh, not many people know that I was a certified personal trainer for four years and like fitness has always been a huge part of my life. Or in school. Yeah. Again, I, was, I was picking up on that in some of your content on like social yeah, media and stuff. You can, you can definitely see it. It's just not something I openly advertise nearly as much anymore. Yeah. I used to have like a fitness Instagram and had clients and all this stuff. But I made kind of an active move to wanting people to see me first as an artist. And then they notice, oh, he's also he's also stays in good shape and right. And, yeah. And, and all that. But for so long, it was like, oh, he's the fit guy. And then that was like how people thought of me. And it's yeah, yeah. which is pretty it's a pretty narrow look. So being viewed as an artist or a creator is much, much better in my mind. And then. Subsequently, yeah. people find out, oh, he also is, you know, pretty serious about fitness. That's a great addition. Yeah, for sure. I know I um I know I was always into fitness myself. Well, not always, but the past two to three years I've gotten into it pretty hot and heavy. Mm-hmm. It's a great it's, thing. Great thing. Oh my gosh, man. So so um what are some other things people might not know about you if there's anything that comes to mind? Hmm. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm a relatively open book. You know, I, I don't find myself trying to like hide aspects of my life. Um, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. One thing, I mean, you don't hear it when I'm speaking normally, but half my family's from Texas, half my family's from Tennessee. So like, and I grew up with country boys. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of country in my upbringing. And <laughs> Whenever me and my friends are hanging out back home, we're just talking like, you know, we, we bring it on, turn it on when you got to. You know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah. People also don't expect that um, when they see me as this like, you know, formal opera singer or whatever. They don't realize that I'm like half redneck. <laughs> <laughs> you literally have a piece of cornbread in your back pocket. <laughs> Dude, anytime, cornbread. <laughs> cornbread, people. For those of you that don't live in the South, cornbread is amazing. You need to try it. That's the secret to becoming a base cornbread. <laughs> yes, it is. That and hot coffee, black <laughs> exactly. coffee. Bingo. <laughs> oh man, it's great living in the South. I'll tell you. <laughs> so, um, what are some things that you like to do in your off time when you're not, you're not doing YouTube, you're not singing professionally, et cetera. 
Yeah, man, there there isn't a whole lot of it in these days. Um, I love hiking when I can. It's tough. It's tough in Philadelphia. Um, you can take some public transport to some parks, but uh, it's not like hiking in Virginia or somewhere much more rural. So I like to hike when I can. Um, I just started learning how to play the guitar, which is something I've oh. I had, yeah just started like a, like a week and a half two ago. It's something I've been you know considering doing for like literally ten years, and finally just like buy, <laughs> buying a guitar. <laughs> yeah. Literally just mostly just so I can play like simple country songs and accompany yeah. myself. Like to me, that sounds like so much fun. So I've been playing a lot of guitar lately. I also I also love uh shows and movies. Um I you know nowadays because there's so much going on, I'm lucky if I get an episode in of something a day. Yeah. But love, love shows and movies. If I can sit down and just turn my phone off and just watch something captivating, that is for me, that's a great evening. You still watch Game of Thrones? Oh yeah. Bro, <laughs> yeah, that's what I, I figured you did, but I was just like, "Well, man's busy." Yeah, huge fan. I mean, I, I'm not. I yeah, I, re, I rewatch Thrones every couple of years, probably. Um, and there are some other shows. I find myself, I'll per year, I'll rewatch. I'll probably rewatch a couple of shows I love, and I'll try out some new shows. Yeah, um, but I I never binge anything because I just don't have chunks of time. One yeah, thing. it's fine. I'd rather be busy. Honestly, I'd rather be busy. Yeah, the end. The end of the day, too. It's awesome to be doing something with your hands and your voice and whatever you you do with your with your career than it is to like be trying to entertain yourself in another way. Yeah, right, it's, right, right. It's just something about it. It's just sat, so satisfying. Like I found with me doing this YouTube channel, it was a totally spontaneous thing. I just decided. I just picked up and decided to start doing it, and it's like. Oh my, oh my gosh, man, this is, I've got something to do with my free time now. I don't actually have to spend it like watching TV or whatever else I yeah. want to do. I actually like, like, I have something to dedicate my time to. Yeah. And, and you it, find that other people are happy to listen, <laughs> which is a bonus, you know? This is amazing, guys. He he can attest to it because he he's got a much larger channel than me. And he saw this way before I did, but it is amazing to know that people actually want to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I remember um, the first one I did because people in the in a Discord server I was in kept telling me because of my background I should do the reaction and analysis stuff, and I was like, no, 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 it's stupid, whatever. <laughs> Which I, by the way, I do still. Then I will say this: I will scream it from the rooftops. I do think straight up reactions, without any, without, without adding like any any value to it or like hardly any yeah. commentary, I do think those are just. I think those people are leeches. <laughs> I think. <they're, laughs> They're just sucking off the talent of other people. Um, so I, I think if you make reaction videos, even if there's, I think there are some reacts out there, a number of them that I've, you know, that I'm in touch with that I think are great because they're charismatic and they make people laugh. And that is yeah. one kind of, that is one kind of value, you know, but the people that just like turn it on, short intro, watch the whole thing straight through, short outro, done. I'm like, get the fuck <laughs> off YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh sometimes i feel kind of passionate about it too but then i'm like i don't want i don't want to piss anybody off yeah i don't care at this point <laughs> it's it's a good point though like i like that was kind of a big thing for me when i started doing this stuff like i don't necessarily have like a degree in music but i come from uh, a background of singing since i was five and i come background of multiple years of playing playing instruments etc mm -hmm. kind of like you in that regard but yeah, it doesn't, have to be, it doesn't have to be formal. Like I, that's something somewhat unique that I bring is like pretty advanced physiology and stuff like that. Yeah. But, I mean, there's a million types of musicians and everyone's got something important to say. Yeah, for sure. And that was one of the big things too. Like I told myself that if I was going to do something like this reaction kind of gig, I wanted to make sure I was bringing like more than just a, ha that was a yeah. crazy low note. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I salute you for that. Um, what, what I was going to say before I went off on that tangent. Um, I remember, so people were asking me, oh, you've got to do this, you got to do these videos. And I said, so I remember I made one for the bass gang, but that was just because Bobby and his sister wanted to see the bass gang's reaction to bury a friend to that two summers yeah. ago. Yeah. So I made that one, but with no plans of doing a, another one. I think even in that video, I was like, this is probably my one and only reaction video. Yeah. Eventually, after another few months of pestering, I decided to do my first 
legit one, which was to Jeff's Misty Mountains. Yeah. And I remember I remember seeing the stats the first night after I released that, and I was like, holy shit, I have to keep doing this. Because it was like it was like it was like 3,500 views in the first day, which for me at the time was absolutely bonkers. And it was like a yeah. thousand hours of watch time. And I was like, <laughs> like compared wow. to those stats compared to the stats I would get on like an acapella cover. I was like, oh my God. And this took one tenth of the time to make. Or yeah. Less. So and, for me, it was just it, like, all right, necessary evil reaction analysis. Let's get it. <laughs> That was, and it turns out it was one of my personal favorites too, because just watching you react to those thick freaking G ones in that cover, right. my favorite G ones ever. Probably. Um, <laughs> now I have, I actually have three YouTube shorts coming out per week right now. I have an editor making shorts for me, and yeah. the ones from this week are are from that video <clears throat> actually. Yeah, I was I was watching those. That, not, th- the G one one where i'm freaking out about the g1 literally might have come out like an hour ago i haven't checked but i think that's the one that was releasing today i'm gonna have to check that out whenever we get off here me with the vipers like being like (laughs) (laughs) you've really you've really struck a groove with that that pit viper vibe completely impromptu Impromptu. and i wore them and i was like maybe this would be funny and then Literally in the com, it became it became something immediately. People were like, "Whoa, Jeff got two pit vipers!" I was like, I just got "Out of my ass!" <laughs> it's one of my favorite things about your yeah. channel too, is that you just come up with it on the spot and it becomes an immediate thing. Yeah, dude, people are looking out for him now. You got to check out this song. There's so many pit vipers. <laughs> so many pit viper moments. <laughs> it's a good vibe, man. I'll tell it's real, you, it's a real thing in the reaction sphere. Hilarious. That is for sure. People, I mean, people have talked about those. Like, you know, in the base gang Discord, all you hear about sometimes is pit viper moments in some of these covers. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> is it not like pretty baffling that something? Yes, let's go. Let's go. What's up, baby? Pits, the pit vipers. Gonna, He's gonna, got the. The brightness is going to be insane for a few seconds, but that's okay. You know what? <laughs> that's. Actually, we should probably retake the thumbnail and I'll be doing this. Yeah, we'll do that after. We'll retake the thumbnail after this and we'll do something stupid with yeah. the pit vipers in there. Perfect. Perfect. I've got a similar pair of glasses. They they're not like like snowboarding ish ish glasses, but yeah. they're more like they're they're the same shape, so we'll have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Double pit vipers on the interview. Double pits. <laughs> oh man. All right. A little bit back on track here. Yeah, here we go. Um so um practice so how often do you practice Mm. vocally and um how often do you practice good question uh this is where being an opera singer gets serious because you have to put in so much time doing the most boring stuff um for sure so now i nowadays i practice monday through friday and i take the weekends off uh mainly because operatic singing is so big and full-bodied that you go through five days of doing it for a few hours, you you really need to take a couple of days to recoup. Even if you still feel fine at the end of the week, it's just yeah, big time off. And Someone something that I've that was just something that I noticed, like with your opera music and like just like just the way you do that stuff. It just it seems very. I can feel the energy being drained out of me just watching it. Yeah, you, you and you wouldn't believe how loud it is in person. It is like it's essentially for for men singing an opera anyway. It's like healthy it's really healthy efficient yelling it's like (laughs) it's that much energy and it's pretty much the same mechanism you just like learn how to yell beautifully (laughs) that's the that's a great way to describe it opera ladies and gentlemen the definition of opera is learning how to uh yell beautifully yeah healthy yelling for women it's healthy screaming (laughs) no joke so yeah so i practice monday through friday a lot of it at aba um again just a reminder the the academy of vocal arts where i train a lot of it is working with a coach or working with a voice teacher um usually i'll I'll warm up for half an hour on my own have probably two hour long vocal coaching sessions and then maybe practice a little bit more than that on my own yeah um but there really is only so much big operatic singing you can do that's just singing though then you know the being an opera singer you also have there's so much text you have to learn in foreign languages 
and you yeah. have to know the translations and you have to go through and you know be making artistic and character choices and um really studying the score like the actual music there's there's so much time you spend studying so the actual vocal aspect is probably like a quarter of the time you really spend doing all the stuff that requires that's required to be an opera singer day to day so yeah. you might you might practice for two hours but you might study for another four or five de depending on what's coming up you know some like it's... sometimes there's i don't have much to do but like right now i'm gearing up to sing a lead role in italian in the spring taking a lot of my time like that's where i, sp I spend a lot of my time studying that music on a side note, will this uh, piece that you're doing the lead for, will this be available on any uh, YouTube platform sometime? I wish my institution would get in the 21st century and start doing that. So maybe I'll try to push for it. <laughs> <laughs> I would, so, I'd be interested to hear this. Yeah, it's I'd called, be interested it's called to hear it. Don Giovanni by Mozart. It's one of his most famous operas for sure. And uh, currently I'm, I'm singing the, the title role, Don Giovanni. That's gonna be cool. Yeah, just Guys, started. It, just started coaching it with the the head music guy, the maestro at our at our institution, and it does. We don't perform it till April. So if that tells you how much time goes into yeah. preparing a big role, you know, months and months. Yeah, and to give to give you guys a little bit of insight, if you guys aren't that familiar with how long it takes to truly feel feel music, in addition to just playing it or singing it, like even high school, like middle school bands, like like orchestras they all spend several months on learning just one piece and they'll spend hours at a time in their rehearsals lists literally spending just on this one piece that they're trying to pretty much perfect for the one performance mm -hmm. yeah it's so it's probably a similar time commitment maybe a little more on our end because as you get better yeah. you do the simple things faster and you just get way more down to the details yeah um, yeah it's months months and months of preparation at a very high level to to get ready yeah for sure um what is your uh warm-up routine whether it be for opera or for any other kind of singing and uh do you have a go-to warm-up yes um i do i always do uh like a neck stretching session and uh what's called a laryngeal massage just like loosening all these muscles up loosening the tongue up, loosening the jaw. Um, and then from there, I'll go into a little bit of straw work using a straw, um, also called a semi-occluded vocal tract, an SOVT position, which helps the vocal folds phonate based on literally the physics of how the vocal folds function. Um, yeah. I'll do that for a bit, and then I'll move to like an mm, and then a z, and then I'll finally start opening up to vowels like e, a, a, open up to the vowels, and then go into a lot of like the bigger... Um, larger moving passages like maybe scaling a couple octaves or doing some coloratura or riffs if you want to call them that yeah um, and my warm-up start to finish is like usually about 25 minutes i find that's the perfect amount that gets me fully warmed up access to my full range everything's super resonant before anything starts to tire out so that's what i'll do before a coaching session or a voice lesson that's what i'll do before an audition that's what i'll do before a performance um, and then if I don't have any scheduled coachings or anything like that for the day, then after that warm up, I will go into practicing my repertoire, like my songs and arias and whatever in the operas I have to work on and usually do that for another hour and a half or so. Oh yeah. How much water do you end up drinking in during a, like a, like a average music session? Like, or if you're training through opera, do you end up going through like bottles or how, how often do you drink it too? I'm just during, curious. During a practice session, I'll probably drink a liter of water. Um, I, I always drink about a liter right when I wake up. And then if I go to the gym in the morning, I'll probably have another liter or a liter and a half for that. Then I'll have a liter um, during a practice session and then constantly sipping throughout the day. The, the two most important things for singing health by far is sleep and hydration. No question. So sleep well. And I probably end up drinking a gallon and a half of water a day or so i would guess people don't really understand like how good it is for your body to have that much water it is like it is it is it's it's kind of disgusting how well your body operates whenever you fuel it with the amount of water that it needs 
if you sleep well and you're hydrated with water and you have like a decent diet, you feel like a machine. Yes. True. Like nowadays <laughs> I've been, I've been really dialing in my sleep and the diet's good and all this stuff. And I have you know, that one cup of coffee in the morning and I have good, clean energy from, you know, 7am to like, when I start shutting everything down to like nine, nine thirty. So like what have getting, you found? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Just say like getting getting towards bed. Like I I'm usually I'll probably be asleep by like eleven most nights. But yeah, it's a good like twelve to fourteen hours of like usable energy, which is insane. How much yeah, you can get? Is. I mean, today it's like my day was basically get up at seven, work for a couple hours, then like nine to today was a pretty long day for ABA standards. It was like nine to six was opera stuff. Then yeah. I get home, shoot this interview. I'm probably going to shoot a new reaction analysis video after this. And then by that time, it'll be like time for me to like eat a snack, play some guitar and go to bed. But that's the whole day straight through with no yeah. breaks really. And like energy has been good. So that's really just that's hydration, nutrition and sleep. Period. Have you ever have you ever had any sleep issues? Um, not for long periods of time. There definitely have been life events that have made me more anxious or whatever yeah. for, for a period of time. Um, but fortunately, none of them have lasted. I've historically gotten pretty good sleep. Um, and lately, it's just been better, which is nice. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I was just curious because I have um, I've struggled all my entire life to get sleep every now and then. I would just end up waking up hot or waking up several times for seemingly no reason. I'm going to so, send you a link to something right now. It's going to save you. I am much appreciative of this. And this is not a traditional question. I was just genuinely curious to ask him about that since he brought it up. This guy named Andrew Huberman. Um, he's a neuro. Oh, yeah, I've heard of him. Neurobiologist out at Stanford does tons and tons of research to bring people free content to just make their lives better basically and yeah. i recently I've, I've watched a number of his episodes most recently the ones on caffeine and the ones on sleep which i'm almost done with now such great useful practical information i'm literally sending it to everyone i know who's like who struggles with sleep because he just drops knowledge that is pretty easy to follow <clears throat> um, despite all the sciencey stuff yeah, so, and I, I know very little about sleep, so this will be nice. And if give, I can like, if yeah, I can get more shot. sleep, yeah, give it a shot. Yeah, I want to get off of uh, that old Zequil junk. Yeah, you know, you won't need it after this podcast. Sweet man, I'm <laughs> excited already. This is great. <laughs> yeah, it might take a few days, but if you follow like his guidance, I'm, I, I've always slept pretty well, and it's already been helping me the last Dude, few, like, week. That's good to know. Yeah. That's good to know. Oh, um, moving on from a warm up uh, question from previous. Um, do you have any tips on how to relax your vocal cords or heal your vocal cords? Should they have been damaged or injured in any way? Mm, um, the first what was the first one. How not to. So basically how to relax your vocal cords, how to relax them, whether it be there, you just feel tense or they've been singing for a while or. Yeah, whatever. I mean, the vocal so what happens when you sing is you build up inflammation um, for most singers that what happens when you build up inflammation is you lose the bottom part of your range, mm -hmm. basically, and um, the voice gets a little thinner. Um, but as far as relaxing the voice to sing, all of that is done basically everywhere but the vocal folds. So it's all like happening upstream, essentially. Yeah. So like if you are if you are breathing in a relaxed, deep manner, if you've got all these muscles loosened up and not tense, if you don't have jaw tension, if you don't have tongue tension, then the voice is going to be free and loose. If any of these things is clamping and grabbing, then because you're not using the rest of the body properly, the throat's going to want to grab and push from the voice to make the sounds come out. Right. And that just completely kills your power and endurance yeah um, you can get away with it for a while as a young singer as you get older that there's less and less you can do um but that's how it is so it's it's all downstream so you so to be relaxed as a singer like to have a really clean steady natural vibrato that you can sustain everything else has to be working properly properly the vocal folds are like the last thing and if the rest is not working well they're going to be working way too hard they basically 
should just be there to phonate and do nothing else. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people do like kind of get that get that confused because then they will be like, how do I relax my vocal cords? And then they'll get misinformed on the internet and they'll be like, it'll be something to do with your vocal cords. And I was like, it's interesting to know that it's actually everywhere except your vocal cords. And your yeah, it's, it's, it's funny how little vocal technique has to do with your actual voice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they literally just pop, pop. That's all yeah. they do. And they don't have, they don't have uh, like pain receptors or anything. So you can't even feel them to know if they're tight. You just yeah. have to tell by the sound coming out and you judge from what the muscles around them feel like. See, and I'm learning here too, folks. So this is <laughs> this is cool stuff. It's the physiology background that some yeah. people can't get enough of. Some people are like, dude, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I just started getting into like understanding physio the physiology of the voice and, the, and that stuff. It's interesting. It's I didn't really know much about like human anatomy until uh, before I went to EMT school and I was actually an EMT for five years. Oh, there you go. But um, I, I was kind of intrigued by like the we were given a very brief anatomy of the just this area, particularly the neck, throat, e ENT kind of yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. And I never I wanted to I always found myself wanting to know more about it. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, there we go. Like yeah, this yeah. Is good, it's pretty, this it's is a good place to. Pretty fascinating how it all works. Yeah. Oh. Um. So moving into a little more singing from like back from anatomy. So, um, for those that don't know what your range is, what is hmm. your current chest range? Oh my god! Like, uh, like record or like daily usable? Uh, daily usable, and then we'll move on to records. So daily usable, I can record most mornings down to probably a B flat one, um, for sure, like a B one. But I'd say most mornings B flat at this point. Throughout the rest of the day, C two, low C. Um, and then in opera, I'm pretty darn comfortable at this point singing up through a high G, so a G four. Um, yeah. But I mean, I can push my chest voice. To the point where it's hard to tell if it's a Chester mix. Like I've sung, I've sung up to like high B's, high C's for tenors, and they're like, that sounds pretty like, legit. <laughs> like C5 um, and such. Yeah. 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 Um, because like right now I know, like I know how to do it. So I can really stretch my vocal folds. It's yeah. not that I should be singing tenor rep. I just I can I can make it happen. Yeah. You know, so it's yeah, I'd say probably B to B pretty much. Yeah, I'll say B to B. And I'm and, to me, it's uh, I'm not gonna lie to you. I think we're, we've got basically the exact same chest range, usually, really? anyways. <laughs> right yeah, in the this, mornings, this, I'm gonna be one. And this is not like operatic range. I would only like pretty much operatic basses. You want to be solid from F2 to F4 because of the amount of power and control and resonance you have to have. Right. So for opera, I'm like F2 to G4 or so, and then you know. Like we just recorded stuff for the bass gang and we had to sing a bunch of low Bs and that's like no problem in the morning. But I oh, could yeah. never use that note in an operatic context. No, you, you, I mean, it starts getting hard to project that low. You just can't. Like really, like no one. I mean, there are a few people in the world that can sing that low in an operatic context. It's It takes a freakish, like a Glenn Miller type voice. Glenn Miller is crazy. Yeah, insane. I mean, like, one in a, <laughs> like one in a billion I'm 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 trying to find a way to get him on here at some point. That would be hard to do, I think, but I I've think seen, I can do I've it. I've seen him do podcasts before, at least one. That would be cool. But he's I'd busy. I mean, you know, he's the most sought after oral profundo in the world, so he's he's always around doing stuff. Oh yeah, for sure. Oh, um, so what are your record highs, record lows in different or any register that is not an extended technique? Um, lowest I've recorded still is a G sharp one. There may have been occasions when I had a G, um, that I just didn't record. Um, but G sharp one, um, that's chest. Lowest chest fry that maybe still counts like a pitch. I think I sang a G zero, um, but can sing, but can sing like pretty solid down to like C one. If I'm like nice and warmed up, I can chest fry pretty cleanly down to like C1 every day. Um, subs, my lowest is C1. I uh, pretty much have probably a D1 every day. 
at least in the morning usually like maybe e flat one otherwise yeah um high range usually if i'm warm i can squeal up to like a soprano high c and like a really thin kind of whistle tone um i think the highest i've ever sung uh recently maybe like d or e that's pretty rare tommy tommy can sing higher than me that way um i don't know about inhale i can inhale i never do it growl same thing i can do it but i don't um back in the day this this was like well after puberty but i still somehow had freakish high notes i could literally sing up to like d7 holy crap when i was like a senior in high school yeah you no weren't shit. whistling this no that's crazy absolutely insane can't do it anymore <laughs> no no you listen you listen to peter's timbre here and you just like no that's never gonna happen not even close to being in the cards nope no 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 <sighs> and most of, most of, most of that's unusable like c6 up notes up in there i've got to be really warmed up it's got to be a certain kind of day the yeah. low notes are probably more reliable most days really something and, else i've always I've, i was wanting to run by you i'm gonna go off topic for a second but um what are your thoughts on people that try to do beyond what is reasonable in music as far as to the extreme low or extreme highs <clears throat> Uh, you mean you mean people just like singing or people claiming vocal just range? Stuff? More like more like singing, I would say. Just like anyone that does perform it. What are your thoughts on like extreme lows, extreme highs? Like, do you think they have a purpose? You know, I definitely think lo uh, lows lose quality pretty rapidly after about like an F one, almost no matter the technique. I mean, like. You can sing like, I mean, I have Bobby, Marwan, all those guys. We've all sung notes down to like C1 and lower. But like in to my ear, like F1 is like the last note that really sounds awesome and really sounds like a note <laughs> kind of yeah. thing. I'm kind of funny, in the same boat. Which is funny because that's that's where like the lowest natural chest voice chest voices are. So maybe we're like it's some kind of conditioning thing. Like we're just not really used to notes lower than that. So they start to sound weird. Even, even like a really clean sub is like, eh, to an untrained ear, people think it sounds like a burp, which yeah. is hilarious <laughs> for people who are familiar with the techniques. But yeah. Um, yeah. For me, like F1 and below rapidly loses usability and quality. Yeah. Um, I don't know about the upper end. I mean, I've heard, you know, really great operatic sopranos can sound, awesome up to like f6 and g6 and there's a few arias where notes are written that high uh, but yeah i mean much beyond that it really is it's just like you know it's well, it, it's almost like a um for lack of better terms it's a term that i think was coined in the bass gang's uh discord is uh at that point it's like range wanking. range wanking. yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just curious, but yeah, I, I'm in the same bandwagon too. I was like, at some at some point, like lows, your voice. I mean, the human ears can only hear so low and so high anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So after a certain point, it it becomes borderline useless. I think it's so. Yeah. This is a this is what I try to get the young singers to take home that I mentor in the bass singing nation group. It's just like it's so much more important to have even an octave and a half of good usable notes than your six octaves of bullshit. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm in that boat a hundred percent. I just got chief in the, in the base gang nation discord, which is really cool by the way. Thanks guys. Um, and I'm totally in the same boat. Like yeah. it just, it's like, it would be much better to have full vocal fold closure, super resonant, a, a massive projectability, in your voice than it would be to have a range wank of six octaves and you you have bad vocal vocal closure bad technique hmm. you know yeah. it's it's way better and that's the whole thing about being an opera singer is like your operatic range is range that you can sing against an, or an orchestra with you know i mean you got to be able to literally what just about fill up a room with your voice over a massive wall of sound behind you oh yeah huge huge spaces it's huge with, with no microphone i mean it's crazy and generally, whenever massive. you're whenever you're singing low notes like low Fs and stuff, 
it's written in a place where the orchestra is really soft because otherwise you'd have no one would can sing over a full blast orchestra that low not yeah. even glenn miller yeah um, even his low notes which are absolutely incredible are still not nearly as loud as a trained opera singer in their upper range yeah just I mean, not possible that and the fact that like middle to higher range notes they just tend to be louder anyways if you it's are singing properly, sits, yeah. even if you have an absolute canon basso <clears throat> profundo low end if you are singing with good technique and you're singing properly your middle and high will be way louder than your low way yeah. louder way louder <laughs> For sure. Yeah, range making <laughs> stupid. Do it all you want, but like, don't brag. About it. Yeah, don't brag about it, and don't go so low that or so high that the human ears start having trouble to discern what the pitches are. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So, um, what are some of the your some of your favorite artists that you've collabed with in the past? Hmm. Um, I mean, I haven't, I mean, obviously the guys in the bass gang, no brainer. Yeah. I've, I've really, I have, I have really enjoyed collaborating with all the people that I've collaborated with truly. So like we got to work with Melinda and we got to work with Lauren Paley. We got to work with Jonathan Young. We got to work with Colin McGinnis, Elliot Robinson. Um, we Some have, of the biggest TikTokers singers out there. Yeah, we have a we have a really really exciting one coming up in February, which I can't reveal, but awesome. Oh man, that's um, awesome. My friend Rachel Quervelt has done a I've done a couple songs with her. I just did a cover with Jennifer Glatzoffer that came out today. Yes, um, our our cover from from Frozen. Super yes. fun, super fun. She she's she's such a great person, and it was so easy to work with her, and it was just a really fun project through and through um and it's adorable like <laughs> i would never call something i'm a part of adorable that video is adorable <laughs> um, that's awesome yeah so i mean like honestly it sounds cliche but pretty much all the collaborators i've worked with are like my favorite collaborators <laughs> i mean it may come across as cliche but i mean if there's genuinely nobody you can't pick a favorite everybody's your favorite and nobody's your favorite i mean it's a good mentality to have too yeah, because for sure for sure it, it just it's just an example that you're it's just a i don't know what i'm trying to say it's it's proof that you're having fun with what you do yeah so definitely. i mean my my favorite for sure are the collaborations when i just have to send in audio and video like the ones yeah. that I'm the master of, I don't enjoy enjoy as much because it's <laughs> it's so tedious. Three times the work, right? Yeah, like Yellow Flicker Beat, I'm couldn't be more proud of that piece, but it was a nightmare <laughs> to, to <laughs> attend. You know, same it's with a shame Tony. I haven't had the opportunity to hear this yet. Oh, you haven't heard Flicker Beat with the bass? Not guy? yet. That's oh man, it's it's sick. Um, and Bones too is the latest one I did for them. Like yes, oh, Bones is good. It's epic and. It, you know, I got to use some of my EDM production stuff, which is cool, but yeah, huge pain in the ass <laughs> to get together. <laughs> For sure. You know, it's like the one with Jennifer Glassoffer. It's like sending these vocals, literally recorded in like 20, 30 minutes, and then shoot this video another 20, 30 minutes, done. And then we get this great project that's product that's super fun and it's like an yeah. hour work. <laughs> I mean, and, it's, and it turns out great too. Yeah, that for me, that's great <laughs> right there. I was just, I was curious. I was going to be kind of curious about that piece. We'll go off topic for a second, but I would kind of tell me a little bit about it if you can, like how it went down and the stuff. Project with Jennifer? Yeah. Yeah. Um, she, re she reached out maybe over the summer about, about doing a song together. And we were <laughs> kind of going back and forth on what. Uh, we figured Disney is a great thing. And it got inspired because, like, both of our fall, our, our audiences have been like, you guys should, you guys should do something together because we're both, we're two of the reactors that, you know, have professional experience as singers. She's done a lot more musical theater type stuff, singer songwriter stuff. I've done opera and other things. Yeah. Um, we kind of came, came together on <clears throat> something Disney and they were thinking like, we'll do something romantic because the followers will like that. And there's a million good romantic Disney songs. Yeah. And then we settled on frozen cause we figured the release time would probably be like winter time. Yeah. Um, and then we just picked that duet from frozen. And decided to do the original key, decided not to make it on my end like a bassy cover, just like sing the Disney Prince shit. 
just like do it <laughs> flex those high notes there are a few high a flat belts like yeah that have become pretty comfortable over the last year or so um so it was it was fun for me to do something you know in the original key that wasn't bassy it was like a, a nice stretch in the other direction yeah um so yeah send my vocals in she did a quick mix sent them back shot the video put it together overall very simple project but that's that's kind of how it came together I'm curious. I was just curious because I was I was considering doing a reaction and analysis of this whenever I was uh, coming up oh, with some um, yeah. coming up with some content for December. So I was just curious. I've also got her making an appearance on here as well. Cool. She'll be coming in, I believe, the second week of January. So that'll Thank be you. really cool. <clears throat> sure to watch that one. She she's pretty awesome. I've been talking with her about some stuff, and she's super talented for sure. Yeah, definitely. Let's see. Uh, what's my next one here? Uh, so we went with favorite artists. Um, do you have any tips, tricks, or life hacks for any beginner or intermediate vocalist or anyone that is wanting to make a living in the music industry? Yeah. Uh, any vocalist? Really boring, but practice, practice, practice. <clears throat> like, technique is the most important thing. Whatever you're especially for opera singers, but for any genre, you have to put in the time doing your scales. You have to put in the time doing all these boring vocal exercises and you really need to do them multiple times per week. And your voice will strengthen and your range will increase and you'll figure things out about your voice that you had no idea you could figure out. But yeah, you have to, you have to put in the time. There are, there are people who are crazy gifted and just can riff and do and sing high and sing low and they don't even think about it. Unless you're one of those absolute freaks of nature, I was not one of them. You've got to put in the time of practice. Yeah, for sure. That's and I, he he's speaking to me as well because I did. I mean, I've been singing since I was five, but I didn't really fully recognize my vocal potential until about a year ago. And I've really been working on it. And I'm like, not only like, is this like a question mm -hmm. for like all my viewers and your viewers alike, but this is also a. <laughs> <laughs> question for me too because i'm still learning myself as far as my vocal ability so yeah man put in <clears throat> put in the time and you'll see the results it's, it's yeah a one-to-one -one ratio <laughs> it very much seems like it that's what i've been figuring out um so <laughs> this is a bit of a not this is a bit of an easy question because we kind of already touched on this and we kind of already know how you feel if people watch your videos but <laughs> extended techniques so what are your general thoughts about them and um what is your particular favorite one if you have one i think yeah i think extended, <laughs> lower extended techniques i guess we're talking about um i think they're fantastic i i i mean the my voice teacher in undergrad knew how to do subharmonics that was the first time i'd ever heard it that was like you know six six years ago or so at this point and That's since then cool. it's crazy how far knowledge of subharmonics has spread to the point where every young bass like knows how to do subharmonics i think much. they're great because now any like forever every choir in the almost every choir in the world especially in high school and college they need low basses yeah. and now you can have any baritone even some tenors learn subharmonics and you can have a bass section for the especially low stuff <laughs> You always want to have a natural bass when you can. It is different, but yeah. it has really opened up the window for choirs all over to have to be able to program music with low notes. Because, you know, a lot of high school choirs and my undergrad choirs, you know, like you had to have a relatively low bass to sing a lot of the good choir rep. Yeah. So I think they're great. And I think um, they are, they have, I mean, like the bass gang. You know capitalizes on it big time it's like people are really amazed by super low notes um and yeah. it's just it's become a part of especially the modern acapella genre um with people like tim and avi and jeff it's just like really low bases yeah um so i think i think they're fantastic i don't know if i have a favorite i mean the one i'm best at compared to other people is chest fry the strong yeah strong chest fry um, I pro I think I I like subs more because subs are cleaner, 
Um, like if you have a really good control over subs, you can get you can do a lot of really cool stuff. Whereas chess fry, there are, there are certain baselines that are really hard to do and be accurate about because chess fry is inherently more unstable than a sub harmonic. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say subs are my favorite. My best, I guess, is probably chess fry. Yeah, I I have to agree with you that I think that probably subs are my favorite. But, um, I don't know. I mean, your chest fry is pretty overpowered. <laughs> I've heard it in a lot of it, reactions and it's pretty good. It is. And it's actually, it's like resonant in person too. I mean, not as much as like a, a really big low chest note, but, um, but I can use it in a choir setting. Like I can sing super low shit in a choir setting and it, and you can hear it. Yeah, for sure. Um, which is cool. I've been, a have I've, I've, See, the funny thing was when I was when I was figuring out what my voice could do, I discovered the the Bass Nation Discord. I joined and I started meeting all these people that told, told us all about these other extended techniques. And I heard learned about subs, learned about aggressive phonation, all this, that, and the other. And I'm like, wait, what's this aggressive phonation jazz? <laughs> it sounded like something I already knew how to do. Yeah. So it turned out I have been making this sound here. Whoa. I've been doing that my entire life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, did, I didn't even know that I've been doing that my entire life. And I was like, you mean to tell me these people are using this in music and I've been doing it my entire life and didn't even know that? Yeah. And I was, I was, I was so butthurt. <laughs> I was so butthurt because I was like, I felt like I came up with this, which I didn't, but I felt like I came up with it at the time. And I was like, Man, this is yeah. this is so stupid. That's another really, I mean, it, it can be pretty powerful and resonant. That's another one you could use in a choir setting if you can control it well enough. Oh, it's it in my personal opinion, it's it's right there along with chess fry as being difficult to control. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's super resonant if you really do it right. Yeah, I've Tommy noticed. Tommy's really good at inhale. I'm gonna have to get him on here and and hear him do his ingressive. That'll be really cool. Yeah, he's he's good. There's there's probably compilations of it at this point. Oh my gosh, dude, that'll be fun. That'll be fun to touch on. That's for he's sure. Great. He's great to talk to. He's fun to talk to. Tommy. Oh man, that's good. It's good to know. Good to know. Um, so this one, this question is not immediately obvious to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask it. It's one of those ones that I threw in there that's kind of optional, but. Mm -hmm. Do you have perfect pitch? Because I I personally want to know, and I I'm curious to know. Nope. <laughs> you do not. I do not. I can usually figure out what a pitch is or get really close if you give me a second, but I do not have the automatic. That's a whatever. I gotcha. Yeah. So I have very I, very trained relative pitch is what I would call it. Yeah, that's that's what I was about to say. Like if I was like if he doesn't have perfect pitch, then he's got really good relative pitch because yeah i've i've something i've noticed through his reactions is that whenever you go through he's really good at at being right on the money with the note but you know i mean like i was just like i don't know he's he, he lands on him pretty quick so i was yeah. like I, I wanted to ask to be sure it's cool i'm usually I'm usually close when i when i guess and then i can figure it out pretty quickly yeah yeah not perfect yeah i got you um <laughs> I'm going to move into a little bit more of a non-serious uh, portion of this traditional questions. So, um, what is, or do you mind sharing some of your funniest memories with the bass gang? So any, if you work with any groups, uh, so if there's any funniest memories that come to mind, you're, mm. are you willing to share them? Oh my gosh. Fortunately, some of the funny moments are, are, you can watch on Casper's channel. We do this. We do this bass gang Jeopardy thing. Yes, I haven't got to watch it yet, but I've heard of it, which is really, really funny. Um, we have a lot of inappropriate, funny moments in the chat, <laughs> which there are countless, countless, countless jokes to make that shall not be repeated. But <laughs> we do have a group chat that is pretty raucous. <laughs> um, <laughs> And we have funny moments like when we're up against deadlines and we're just, it just becomes a complete shit show. Most projects <laughs> becomes a shit show by the end. Um, yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, really, like, it's great. The bass gang is, we would not still be doing stuff together if we didn't work really well together and get along super well. 
Oh, yeah. Like they really, despite having not met any of them yet in person, like they really do feel like some of my, some of my mates. Yeah, um, for sure. Dude. We're comfortable enough to make crude joke after crude <laughs> joke. And <laughs> it's, it's, it's honestly constantly funny memories with them. I feel like honestly, the vibe that I'm getting from you telling me about the base gang, I feel like it's kind of like a, like a living version of Step Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the base singer version of Step Brothers. <laughs> For sure. A lot of stupid, stupid memes, and <laughs> it's a great time. <laughs> oh man, I'd love to get some insight on these conversations one day. That'd just be hilarious to read or watch. <laughs> Someday, maybe. Definitely not Someday. anything going public. <laughs> yeah, for sure, not public. But <laughs> oh, um, so we have got one more for you. Then we're gonna take a bit of a breather. Um, this one's a very broad question and it's a very tough one for a lot of, I've determined that's a tough one for me to answer, but what are, what is one thing that you like about being a singer? So what's one of your favorite things about being a singer is this, you can take this any direction you want. Um. Okay. One thing is it is just really cool to be able to sing along to music. You like any kind of music you can sing along to it. And if you're, an advanced singer you can sing along to most things pretty well or you can sing along to instrumental music you know um, just just being able to interact with music with your voice no matter what it is very cool thing um i'm in the boat with you on that That's yeah awesome. another thing relating specifically to opera is when you are singing really well and when you're really in the zone as an opera singer you feel like a superhero with your voice because it's so much it's so much sound that you're creating out of nothing and like to be to be singing full out like i said remember healthy yelling it feels like you're just you know it, it you're feels doing, like you're really accomplishing something you're doing that against a full blaring orchestra that is a crazy feeling and, and you're more or less people, and knowing that the people on the other side of the orchestra can still hear you yeah yeah it's just filling up the room is just that's that's like even a non opera singer, and to me, that's just that's totally baffling. Yeah, that's just that's awesome it, to it really. It really feels like a superpower. Um, oh my god! So, so those two things: being able to sing along to anything and being really loud when you sing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. cool. Definitely in the same boat with you on that one. <laughs> <sighs> okay, so that brings us to the end of our traditional questions here on the vocast so we're going to take a bit of a breather and or at least more so well either way breather for us both but this will be a time for you to plug any merch you have advertise share anything you would like to share about your musical career your youtube channel anything you have the floor for the next few minutes so uh, let us know what you've got going on yeah so basically my my main focuses right now are my youtube channel and my patreon so if you guys are interested in what i do i say this in my videos if i am bringing learning to your musical experience if i'm helping you enjoy music more um or if you just want to support me in my endeavors definitely go subscribe to my youtube channel and check out my patreon that's for sure the biggest thing that i'm really pushing for now as it continues to be a, a bigger and bigger a support system for me financially as a creator and as an artist. So um, the yeah. Patreon has six tiers ranging from $1 a month to $100 a month. And with, you know, radically varying, radically increasing benefits. Um, so yeah, go over and check it out. It's, I mean, $1 a month is basically nothing. And for 50 or hundred bucks a month, you get a lot of really cool stuff. Um, so yeah, definitely go check out the Patreon. Other than that, I mean, that's pretty much it. Those are the two things I'm playing right now. So, yeah. <laughs> go go check his channel out, folks. Man, The man is super talented. He knows a lot about music. I mean, if you think I know a lot about music, which I I don't feel like I do, but if, if you think I do, go check his channel out. He's got tons and tons and tons of musical insight. You could literally make a master class out of the reaction videos he does. Yeah, if you want to come... Nerd, nerd out and i'll learn a shit ton about singing and music definitely i'm <laughs> checking out my channel yeah for sure 
Okie doke. So um, if you are finished with your um, self-promotion piece, then we'll move on to this piece where you get a chance to ask me any questions that you have for me, should you have any. So you have the floor for that. I was first just wondering where you grew up and where you live, because I'm intrigued by your southern accent. I don't, I don't so, know any southern accents in this uh, in this sphere of the Internet. <laughs> so it's a good question. So I'm actually kind of glad you mentioned that. So I'm actually I live just above Winston Salem in North Carolina. Oh, yeah. OK. So have you ever been down this way? Yeah. I mean, I was born and raised in Virginia, so it's not too far. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, uh, yeah, I'm not far from Winston-Salem, um, born and raised here. Um, not really sure that I'll go anywhere else. Hundred, not hundred percent sure. <laughs> Been cool. here. Yeah. Hey, you you like know, what's, time. yeah, what's, what's kind of funny too, is that my accent, sometimes it, it kind of comes and goes like, I'll be talking one minute and then the next, my cornbread will come out and then, <laughs> Excuse me, give and me then that cornbread. <laughs> give me give me the cornbread but it'll 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 come out sometimes and then it'll tuck itself away but my, the funniest you. part the funniest part is like whenever like i'm like going ham with this accent like or if i get like mad or whatever you can really hear it like this this accent didn't even really come from my parents because like their accents aren't even that heavy either oh huh. <laughs> so that's a funny little twist yeah yeah, it's actually, you, my, my dad, born and raised in Texas, and my mom, born and raised in Tennessee, neither of them have Southern accents. <laughs> and, yet, to me. <laughs> and yet. sense me. And yet. And yet. Yeah. Here we are. <laughs> we are. I think the only reason I can do it is because I grew up playing baseball with, like, backwoods country boys. Fair enough. That Proper You know what? That makes necks. sense. Proper rednecks. Like, like um, chewing tobacco. Uh, lifted oh. trucks, boots. Oh, 100%. Yeah, 100%. These boys, Nelson County, Virginia is like country. <laughs> and I, and my ba the baseball park I played at was really near Nelson. So all them boys would come over. And man, it's like they're talking a different language. <laughs> <laughs> That's the funniest part about Southern, too. It'd be like, y'all people down there be speaking a different language. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Oh um, man, it's good. I enjoy it down here. So, just like, what is your background with music? So, to give you more context, I've really been singing probably since I was around five. But I would say I've been more singing, singing more and often. I guess you could say ever since I was probably twelve or thirteen, right before you know the big puberty happened, and mm -hmm. then. I realized <laughs> the big puberty. No, I'll tell you, I was the squealiest son of a gun with my voice when I was that young. And then my voice dropped. And then I was, a, I turned into a wannabe bass singer when I was like 14. Oh, we all did. <laughs> I mean, we all did. I mean, I had, I had an F2 in chest and I was like, I'm a bass singer. Let's go. <laughs> so, so, so is yours. So yours, you drop and it's continued to go steadily. down. Steadily, yes. Yeah, mine's mine's so. the same way. Like when my voice first dropped, it was probably like seventh grade or something. And I remember singing along to something and I had like a pretty strong like G2. And I was like, oh, I'm feeling pretty bassy. Yeah. But I was listening to like, I don't know if you know the group Chanticleer or the bass Alec, uh, Eric Alator. I've heard of them, but I've not heard their music. So he was like their profundo for 20 years. So I was like, my voice is getting lower. I want to sound like that guy. <laughs> I never will. Now I realize now. But um, yeah, so I was always like every morning I'd get up and see how low I could sing. But I was <laughs> but I was really like a proper baritone for a while. But my voice the same way, just like like my upper range got better with training, but my voice kept getting lower and opening up. And it's just very gradually gone down from literally seventh grade until now. Like it's still very gradually getting lower and fuller. You speak in roughly like D2, C sharp to uh d flat two area yeah i think um because i often will just start to dip into chest fry like right at the end of my sentences and it's really resonant so it's hard to tell the difference sometimes yeah um, but when i'm getting down around c when i'm just speaking casually it's probably like some kind of chest fry yeah um i tend to do the same thing yeah i think it i think my voice unless i'm singing it it loses like full chest purity probably around like e or e flat 
on a normal day. But like sometimes I'll chest try speak like down on the first octave because it just does that, you know. I mean, it's I mean it's easy to do too, and you know I mean people like to hear it sometimes. So I oh mean, yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing it right now. They do, they do, they do. <laughs> But um, back to your question, though. So I've I've been singing ever since probably when I was little, but I started singing a lot more probably around when I was like 12 or 13. You know, I I got I got this in my head that I was a I was a bass singer because I had an F2 in chest. And <laughs> um, I I was singing in church, you know, I, I would sing the choirs and do some specials every once in a while, you know, but I didn't really start exploring my voice and, and singing daily for even hours on end until I would say probably about a year ago. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I most of my music knowledge came from the combo of me discovering my voice when I was 12, 13, 14 in that rough age and that and really playing like trombone through band. And I was one of those kids where like I was actually kind of geeked out by band. So like I was like, I this, these cool I things. I love band in middle school. It was it was good, even though we all sounded terrible. Oh, yeah. We all knew we sounded terrible in middle school. <laughs> Sure. I saw it. I saw my video on Facebook the other day. It was a it was a unnamed middle school band playing Jingle Bells, and it made my ears bleed. But it reminded me a lot of um, of, of of my history. Yeah. <laughs> so I started in sixth grade with trombone. I ended in senior year of high school with it. Okay. I I was not very faithful to it in sixth seventh grade. Picked up on it board eighth. I went into high school. So the local high school actually did a um, like a gym day. They came by. They did. They brought their marching band. So it was more like a show off kind of thing. So like, hey, we want you in marching band. So we're going to play and blow your socks off. So (laughs) that's pretty much what they did. And Mm -hmm. I fell in love with it. So Mm -hmm. I ended up going into marching band, going into um, high school, fell in love with it. It became an art for me. I was in love with the fact that I could play an instrument while moving, lining up with people on a football field, making shapes, Mm -hmm. which is, it's disgustingly cool, by the way. It is cool. Yeah. I, I still, to this day, I just discovered on a, on a side note, I discovered some of my old high school marching band shows on YouTube that some of our parents band boosters had posted at some point. There you go. Uh, So it was a throwback, Mm -hmm. but anyway, Uh, as far as like, I played trombone for seven years going throughout school. And I really, I would say I took it more seriously, eighth grade and up. Um, Ninth grade through 12th in high school is whenever I really got hot and heavy into, I I basically practically slept with that trombone and my my sheet music and stuff. Because I, I was doing marching band in the evenings, Tuesdays and Thursdays from like five to nine. And then mm-hmm. on my off days, I was reading sheet music for concert band. It was during the day. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. but that's, that's really where my musical background came from is just an overarching love for trombone music going through school that, and my recently found love from my voice. I mean, I, I would say I love the fact that I can do the things that I didn't think I could do back when I was still discovering my voice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And now you can sing proper bass stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, at least I feel like I can. I mean, yeah, I, at the end of the day, p- people are torn on my voice classification because in the, in the uh, bass nation uh, discord, I've been given low baritone and I was like, okay, that makes sense. But some people would be like, dude, you're a bass. And like some other people would be like, you're a high bass. And I had one dude tell me he, I was a tenor and I was like, dude, what? People, <laughs> need to worry a lot less about voice classification <laughs> i i made a post about this in earlier in the literally yesterday that saying that cl- voice classification is literally just a label it is and it really it's really important in opera it is actually really important in opera it's really not important anywhere else <laughs> yeah period. pretty much period <laughs> but yeah opera, that's if, if you're labeling yourself wrong and you're singing the wrong repertoire you will fucking <laughs> break your voice trying to sing a full opera yeah, that's not I gonna imagine so. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, if but, you're messing around with something that's too low for you, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Different state. But that's kind of where my voice sits. I'm sure you're probably kind of getting that vibe from yeah. from this podcast so far. Yeah, yeah. My, no, it sounds like you could sing in bass range for sure. I've got 
as far as my range goes, typically like moving on from like where my, like my musical knowledge came from my range, typically usable range. Like I was telling you earlier, it more or less matches yours, but I tend to lose that B B one throughout the day. So I'll end up mm-hmm. going, my voice range will bottom out at around C sharp, B flat too. Yeah. I mean, usually like to, to get the B later in the day, I'll have to like compress it. I'll push for it. Whereas in the morning, it's much more relaxed. Yeah. I'm with you on that. That's pretty I've, funny. um, I've recently been praised for, and I don't deserve the praise, but I've been, I've recently been like, I guess, lifted up or whatever the word is, like given more recognition for the fact that apparently that it's a little weird that a low baritone has a C5 when warmed up. <laughs> Pretty high. So, Pretty darn high. Yeah. But um, I'm not range working, guys. I just, I just thought that was interesting that people thought mm-hmm. that was entertaining. We don't but, condone rage working on this channel. No, we do not. <laughs> All right, I, I do have uh, one more question. Um, yeah. What do you have any specific goals for YouTube and or this new endeavor in terms of podcasting and reaction analysis? Because I know you are relatively new to the game. Like yeah, goals, yeah. Twenty twenty three, because we're about to go into the new year. Yeah. So um, it's a really good question. So I've actually going to be. I won't be revealing like too much of like what I do have set in stone, but I'll definitely reveal my ambitions. So I'll take you back to kind of where I was right at a month ago, just before I started this. So I was like something that my dad said to me growing up, really just like I got to thinking about it a month ago. It's something he said, son, you've got the ear for it. You're just not doing anything with it. Hmm. And I was like, That is probably like I got thinking about it and I was like, wow, that was so profound. And I didn't accept. I mean, I didn't I didn't appreciate it that much at the time because, I mean, I was 10 years old and I was he was showing me how to play guitar. And I just I just picked it up and I started playing. I had never played a note in my life. Hmm. And I was like. I got to thinking, I was like, okay, so that's a really profound statement that he made. And I was like, well what can I do to get a foot in the door in the music industry? But see, also just a side note, I never really, I've always struggled with self-confidence as far as my voice. I've been very insecure about the way it sounds. Mm, Yeah. But normal. um, Yeah. And um, that was, I was like, how can I get into the music industry and interact with some of the people that I want to interact with and learn from the people that I want to learn from without particularly feeling like I'm embarrassing myself. If I'm putting out music that I don't particularly love and like, well, and I was like, maybe at some point I'll put a switch out, push out my own music, but I wanted to like, I, then it clicked. I was like, podcast, talk to people, learn, learn more about them, learn about their music, learn about their techniques, what they think, and just talk with them, have a good conversation, you know? And that was like, bingo. So I ended up deciding to do that, but it was literally spontaneous. Like the same day I thought about this, that night, I went and I filmed my first reaction to Mm. um, (laughs) voice plays um, hide and seek. When it rains, it pours. That is exactly right, dude. So I, I filmed that and then I spread the link around like wildfire (laughs) and um, it actually blew up. And I or blew up in um, like in perspective of my channel being being going from 20 to su- subscribers to however many I had after my first video. Yeah, you know, it blew up. How many videos do I actually I mean? Like, how? what are my views on this? I'm curious. I'm going to look real fast on that first video because I'm I'm like 11 videos deep now. Mm-hmm. And then. Let's see my content. So the very first one, it now has just shy of 3000 views, 61 comments and 225 likes. And yeah, that's great can, for a first video. That's a fantastic video. And I think my first, like the first 24 hours, I got like 400 views and I was totally baffled. Yeah. And I was yeah, like, that's, okay, that's so a lot for a channel with no subs. Yeah. So people, people seem to genuinely be enjoying what I'm putting out the, the insight that I'm giving the, the, how much ambition I have. And I was like, I jumped into this, like I am literally going to bring Peter on for one of my first um, podcasts. 
And then I was like, yo, I, I got like Elizabeth Garolzo, you know, who was with literally with voice play on that cover. Like, yeah. it's like some big names already. And like, people were like, this dude is super ambitious. He's probably, it's probably not going to happen, but let's see. And that's, a cool I, thing I, about, that's a cool thing about podcasts. Like, most people are pretty willing to hop on. It's, um, it's like relatively big names. Like, I, um, it's probably before you knew me when I was doing the podcast stuff, but um, like I got to talk with um, I don't know if you've seen Avatar: The Last Airbender or I'm, uh, is it? Are you talk about the old one or the new one? Uh, I think. Uh, yeah, the one the, the one that came out when we were kids. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah but it's like you know maybe the most famous anime show ever made. It's like super famous. Yeah. Um, and I got to do a, an interview with the what the voice the voice of Toph, who's one of the main characters on the show. Yeah. Um, who like really well known um character and, and the blade who does it. So like yeah, you yeah. you kind of get to punch up a good ways in terms of reach when you bring guests on because most people are pretty willing to sit down and chat for a minute. And that's the cool thing too, because I like I like being able to talk with people like you because I like people that are way bigger than I am in, in the, in the view, in the light that I'm brand new, but like I tend, I want to use the viewership that I get from meeting you people and talking with you people to turn it back around and just reach more people, reach more people, mm -hmm. help people to understand and appreciate music. I want to use the people that I meet to meet with them again, reach other people to expand the love for music. It's not, it's not necessarily like a selfish, I want more subscriber, you know, no, it's more like let's appreciate music together. That's why mm -hmm. I love, that's why I'm so ambitious. I'm like, I want to talk to these like people that are so like, like they're nose deep in music theory, mm -hmm. music or being a good singer. They I mean, they're singing all their lives, you know, stuff like that. And I'm like, I want to know what it's like to talk to these people about their music and their lives and such. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it just, it just ended up working out that in tandem with the reactions and breakdowns is just, it's found a bit of a niche because I've got a combo of podcasts and reactions slash breakdowns. So it's, we've, we've already in a bit of a niche area of YouTube with reactions and breakdowns and such, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I felt like I was really, truly finding my niche as a channel or as the head of this channel in doing podcasts and interviewing vocalists and instrument players and such, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. addition to the rate that reactions and breakdowns. Yeah, they all, <clears throat> they all flow together. So I've got some pretty ambitious plans for 2023, but I don't know how, re or how, what's the word? I don't know how possible it is. I've got some massive leads that I may or may not be able to get like people as big as home free or voice play potentially at some point mm -hmm. on here, which I'm I would probably, I would probably piss my pants if that happened, but nonetheless, <clears throat> it would be really cool. But Even as far guys, as like, you know, they're, um, all those guys are again, super well-known in our niche, but you know, you're not reaching out to Kim Kardashian. No, no. Like you can get in, if you can get in touch with some of those guys pretty easily. Yeah, surprisingly, and I was surprised at how easy it was to get in touch with you. To be honest. Yeah, no, we're available. I mean, that's the thing nowadays is all these people you see are on media, you know. Yeah. Just a DM away in most cases. Yeah, and plus, too, I didn't, I didn't want any any of my guests to be to like hear what I'm saying and be like. Oh, he's just using that sphere of content. No, I'm like, if I have you on, then I genuinely wanted to like talk to you, listen to your, or listen to you talk about music and hear about your music and such. Yeah, cool. So, do you have but, like a, you want to hit like thousand, <laughs> ten thousand subs in twenty twenty three? Any any numbers in mind, or is it less? Is that uh, less? really? I, I'm I'm not huge on numbers, but I will say that I went from twenty subscribers that were previously subscribed to my channel for totally different content that I have since removed mm -hmm. to three hundred and eighty in mm -hmm. three week three and a half weeks, which yeah, is just yeah. that is bonkers. Yeah, and for sure. I'm hoping to hit that 1K um, in 2023. I'm hoping to hit it by like spring, maybe. Oh, you will. 
I'm you, thinking I will. And reaction analysis videos. And I tell you that the people seem to love those. And my favorite thing about YouTube with these numbers is that I was not aware of how fast I was growing. Mm -hmm. And it, it was really humbling to me that and the fact that I was started out at 20 and I have 380 now, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. all of you are lovely for that, by the way. Um, <laughs> but I've also I'm up to like 1600 watch hours. I'm almost half halfway. I need to be in order to start monetizing my videos and stuff. I'll get there in a couple of months. I'm hoping so. And to and to be frank, the idea that I can make money off of sharing knowledge and talking with people like this about music is just it's truly humbling and baffling to me hmm. it's, a, I would, it's a great thing about it, the platform. it really much seems like it and i would love to be able to turn around and take the money that i make from youtube and put it back into the craft mm -hmm. and truly like securing more people on here getting stronger equipment you know dedicated office you know stuff like that yeah. yeah, that's what I would love to do with it, particularly. But that's yeah. my goal. My goal is to hopefully be able to monetize my videos by spring. Nice. Good goals. And if we hit a thousand subscribers, by the way, guys, I'm hoping to do like a like a Q&A with me. Um, I might do it like a live stream or something. Stay tuned for that. I'll post some more updates as I consider it and as the numbers move. So we'll see how that goes. No, we still have to answer fan questions, don't we? Oh, yes. Whew. But uh, we're already running like an hour, and we're almost to an hour and a half. No, I'm running out of time to make my own video tonight. Oh, I know. But uh, there's not too many community right. questions, so cool. we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get chopped through them. Um, so I've got this first question is, how did the base game come to be? Oh, proudly my <laughs> – well, partially my doing – I was the one who initiated it. So it was Ooh. right at the end of my collaboration with Bobby for the summit. It's the first time I like collaborated with anyone pretty much. Yeah. Um, and me, Tommy, Bobby, and Marwan were all ambassadors in the Bass Singing Nation group, which you just joined. Right. And at some point, I just tagged the three of them in the ambassadors chat and said, hey, guys, when are we going to do a collab together? Kind of as a joke. <laughs> And then Marwan immediately made the group chat with the four of us and was like, all right, like, let's, let's talk about what we want to do. That was <laughs> really how it formed. So we weren't sure what to do at first. We were going to do one song or we we're going to do a mashup. We ended up doing, you know, the four Billie Eilish songs plus the, the original piece that Bobby wrote for that, or that Tommy wrote for that EP. Yeah. We thought maybe that would be the only thing we do together. And then that went so well and we just worked so well as a team that we're like, oh, well, let's, you know, at least try to do this again next summer. Um, and it's just kind of snowballed from there. So then we put out the second EP and we're now releasing more regular content. Like we put out Bones, then we put out the song, the Halloween song with Lauren Paley. And we have a Christmas song coming out on Friday. Um, we have a song coming out in February with a very special guest. And then we'll probably after that get into May the Base Be With You Volume Three. That's gonna be awesome, guys. You better yeah. stay tuned to that because they are truly they they are truly putting a lot of work into into this music. It's, that it is a out. lot of work for sure. Um, and something else is another. It's a two part question. So they asked how it came to be, and also um, how do you go about dividing up like parts? So like lead mm -hmm. and backgrounds and such. Whoever writes the arrangement, we just trade off doing that. Whoever writes the arrangement designates parts out. Sometimes it's really specific. Sometimes it's just like, okay, Tommy, you're going to sing all of the baritone one line. And like for mine, it was like for Flickerby, this part of what made it so complicated is I gave ev almost everybody a part of every line. So like record, someone recorded a little, a little snippet of bass two, bass one, baritone, you know, which made it. Yeah way too complicated <laughs> <laughs> um you but yeah whoever arranges it just designates the parts we the person who arranges it records a full demo themselves then they send out the parts of their recording that they want recorded the yeah. guys who is designated to sends their parts back then it gets mixed back in now we hire someone for mixing and mastering uh, because we have funds too from patreon which is sweet yeah um but yeah it's pretty much a logistical nightmare all of it. Oh yeah. <laughs> do it all virtually. 
you know. But it but it but it turns out so well considering yeah. the fact y'all literally never met in person. Yep. All all corners of the earth. <laughs> it's it's so cool too because it's just four virtual bass singers doing what bass singers do. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> so um I think you kind of already touched on this, but um this question is how did you uh get more into opera? Or like so like is there anything in particular like made you think opera? So they, they kind of wanted you to elaborate on that a little bit. Um, I mean, the thing that really turned me back towards it was singing that role. My last year of undergrad <clears throat> it was singing because, yeah. because I was a trained singer and programs always need basses. The opera director just reached out and asked me if I would sing this, one of the principal roles. It's like, sure, I'll do it. It'll be fun. And I did it just kind of like, I was like, this is actually awesome. Like <laughs> this, preparing this, performing this live. This is actually what I want to do. So for yeah. me, that was probably the most pivotal moment of when like it went from something I kind of had kicked to the curb to like, no, this is actually the move. So I have a, I have, I added a piece on to this for, as a personal question. So, um, so you told us how you got into opera. So can you briefly like explain to me what it's like like singing an opera piece like so kind of break down the craft a little bit i guess you could say because i'm currently it's not my cup of tea but i'm wanting to make it my cup of tea and understand it better mm -hmm. yeah um whenever you're learning a new piece in opera whether it's just an aria which is a solo song from an opera or an art song which is a solo song not from an opera in the classical world mm -hmm. Generally, you want to start with the text. So you want to get really familiar with the text, with how exactly how to pronounce that, pronunciate that text as if you were a fluent German speaker or Italian speaker or French speaker, sound fluent. Then from there, you go to actually knowing exactly what you're saying when you're singing. So you have the translations perfectly in your head as if you're, so now you're sounding fluent and you know exactly what you're saying as if you're fluent or as close as you can get. Um, and then from there, it goes into how exactly you want to sing it, like what vocal colors you want to use, where you want to put in certain dynamics, all the rest of the artistry going into it. And then, of course, the final stage is the actual presentation, you know, how you're acting, all the affect you're putting into it when you do it. So it's super layered and you always want to start with the text so you know exactly what you're saying and then kind of build it into your voice and then figure out how you want to perform it. So you can scale that down to something as short as a little one minute art song all the way up to an entire 400 page roll in a certain language. Wow. So you can just and you can scale how much time it takes based on that. Yeah, for sure. So um, so uh, do all, this is a personal question, side question. Uh, so as far as opera goes, do are most opera pieces, if not all of them, do they all contain that strong vibrato that you that most people refer to? When, when you whenever you hear opera, you hear the the strong vibrato. So is that is that oh, like yeah. a, it really does happen in every single one, pretty much? Yeah, I mean that is that's the healthiest state of the voice is a free spinning vibrato. If you're singing without vibrato, that means there's tension somewhere. Huh, I did and not you know can, that. You can do that healthily, but yeah, a totally free, well breath supported sound is going to have a very natural, consistent vibrato to it. That is so cool. You, so you hear opera singers doing that bringing it through absolutely everything because if you're singing really well with really good breath support and everything's really free no matter what you're doing vocally there's it's going to be spinning essentially i never thought of it that way yeah that is so cool so i think is, i'm i always wondered about it when i was a kid i was like why do they sing with vibrato all the time and now i realize that's that is if you tried to sing an opera with full straight tone you would snap your voice in half <laughs> that would make sense it'd be really bad too <laughs> yeah it would sound like you're literally yelling and it wouldn't sound good exactly. i guess it would sound like you're yelling and not healthy yelling <laughs> healthy <laughs> healthy yelling uh okay so um one last part to this question and then the next one uh what is your dream opera role if there is one um i mean i'm don giovanni the one i'm studying right now is definitely a dream role for me um Mephistopheles in Faust by Gounod is another one. Then there's a ton of roles by Verdi. Giuseppe Verdi is my favorite opera composer. So like 
Mephistopheles and um, this is Boito is a different composer. Mephistopheles and Boito is Mephistopheles. Um, Philip II and Verdi's Don Carlo. Attila and Verdi's Attila. Um, yeah, those those are like the main few that I really and some of those my voice like it it'll require another decade or more of maturity basically to sing those roles. Oh yeah. So, yeah, those are some looking way down the, the path. Those are those are pretty cool. And I, I wish I could say I, I knew who they were because I don't I don't really study you opera that much. Yeah, major but... opera buff to know. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. I plan to do some more opera listening in the future though, now that I yeah. have a better understanding of how it works. Would recommend. Um uh this question <coughs> goodness. It's related to extended techniques. So do you believe extended techniques should be required in music music education, in your personal opinion? No. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Not required. Because once again, like you've heard me harp on about focusing way more on quality, not quantity. Yeah. You should focus on, if you're a guy singing, you should focus on find the notes in your range that you can have really great quality singing in pure chest. Because at the end of the day, that part of the voice is what matters the most. That should be your main focus. For um, sure. The techniques are great, but only as an addition. Yeah. And it's, it's really more like it's, if, I mean, extended techniques are almost range walking in themselves, just being able to do them. Well, the other thing is like, how are you going to teach a class on subharmonics? Like, what would that class look like? <laughs> good getting, point. Getting good at subharmonics is all about just fucking around in your own time with it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just experimenting with it. Just like you're just sitting around, you're cooking breakfast, and you're like, okay, uh, you know, uh, like, uh, you just know, like testing stuff out. It's not like you go to a class for an hour and a half and just practice subs with a teacher. No. No. <laughs> and and it's a and it's a respectable point of view because at the end of the day, extended techniques are just that they're extended from your original techniques yeah so i mean that's a that's a heavily respectable view on that um has this is a bass game question has the bass game considered covering any quartet songs such as red is the rose or life could be a dream um like barbershop or barbershop-esque you know like some of like the 50s, 40s 50s even 30s like quartet kind of style songs we haven't considered it really i mean all like all of us especially i would say tommy and i have pretty crazy upper ranges but to do proper barbershop stuff you need you need like a proper high tenor you know who's comfy singing really high in chest voice for a sustained period of time and that's just not really our thing like we yeah sure our bass singers we can get up there for a, a minute you know but um I think for that true barbershop quality, you need like the low bass to high tenor timbre contrast. Yeah. And ideally, people pretty well split in between with with baritone and tenor two. So yeah, yeah, maybe for fun, but I'd say likely it won't be our focus. Yeah, that I think that is a pretty cool idea to do. Like a, it would be a really cool side note to do. Like a life could be a dream, but like a like a bass version. Yeah, the the that the, would be cool. The, trick the trick there is that low voices get muddy if they're too close together yeah they do you have to have high enough voices but i'm sure an arrangement could be done oh yeah dude i'm excited i'm excited just talking about it because i know you guys always push the boundaries like voice play I, I compare you guys a lot to them in the sense that you guys tend to push the creative boundaries and I we, have, we have genuinely done some crazy shit <laughs> yeah. like, your arrangements are insane I mean, if anyone's watched my uh, my reaction to y'all's version of hide and seek, I was baffled in several occasions. Like nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Marwan's arrangements are like Emperor's New Clothes is insane. Century <laughs> is insane. He's like, an under 20 year old prodigy. He is. He's a he wizard. He is insane. And his, arrange wizard. his arrangements are absolutely insane. Absolutely impossible to perform live. That's the big difference between what we do and what like voice play does is they can sing their stuff live because for the most part it's pretty simple Five, yeah it's like four voice parts plus perk pretty much yeah we have like 20 30 voices layered at once <laughs> yeah From just like, taking advantage of it though because you have that distance you know it's like absolutely impossible yeah <laughs> so it's kind of a different medium but you know 
we have collaborated virtually, so it has made sense to do it that way so far. Yeah. Um, another one. Do you think that uh, the bass voice should be used more often in other genres of music? Yes, I do. <clears throat> and um, I kind of, I kind of felt like I knew the answer to that, but I was asked to ask you anyway. The trick is, which we I've run into as a producer, is the bass voice because of where it sits doesn't mix as well in like pop music because it competes with you know the bass frequencies and the kick drums and stuff like that and it creates it it's more muddy it's harder to make it clear and stick out whereas like a voice like ariana grande her voice just sits above everything else happening yeah um so that's often why people have opt that's one reason people have opted towards tenors and higher voices in in most styles of music is because it's just easier from like a mixing engineer standpoint yeah but i think it can be done and you just it's 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 i guess less common that there's a bass with a marketable voice in pop music because you've got to be able to do the riffing and you do need to be able to sing high to a certain extent yeah um i think it's just rare that there's a bass voice that has that skill set there are they can more, really cut above yeah yeah there are more tenors that can like move their voice the right way yeah i mean literally our vocal folds are thicker it's harder yeah. <laughs> for us to move our voices like that yeah but um yeah i mean i would love to see more basses in the in the pop world yeah for sure me too um how did you dis or this is another community question how did you discover chest fry and how did you go about improving your chest fry technique after you discovered it I have same as subs just experimentation um i discovered it Hmm. I don't remember if I discovered it singing along with choir music and just trying to like match the profundos or if I started from like home. I have a pretty vivid memory of like me and actually I have a, I have a video of it of me singing along to Hillbilly Bone by Home Free back in like 2017 and just like, <laughs> ripping a loud chest fry down to the G1. And I was like, this is some crazy shit. Yeah. I'm like, I can use this. And this is definitely kind of freakish. And that was before I'd ever really trained it or anything. Yeah. But since then, like, I don't have chest fry practice sessions. It's literally just messing around with it when it's feeling good. <laughs> and yeah. It's, I'm stronger that way. And I, f I feel like that's the best way to do it, too, is just when, when you're feeling it and just, just mess around for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think the only technique you can do really long extended training sessions <clears> with <throat> is your chest voice. Or, you know, <clears throat> women who have trained their head voices like opera singers. Yeah. Like, yeah, I don't think it makes any sense to sit and train your chest fry for like two hours. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to be with you. I think you'd lose your voice pretty quickly trying to do that. Yeah, I feel I feel like you would too. Um, so what are I was or so you're familiar with Fernie, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so yeah. this one was actually submitted by him. Um, mm -hmm. what are some of your favorite things about music theory? So like anything stands out, like cadences, funky chords, odd intervals, quote unquote. Um, Aeolian Cadence and Picardy <clears throat> Third are my two favorite things in music. <laughs> so tell, so give me a brief explanation of the Aeolian Cadence because I reference this a lot in my reaction videos, but I've never really known like what it was called. Yeah, Aeolian Cadence is in a major key when you have a flat six major, flat seven major, back to the one. Um, I wish I could think of an example off the top of my head because normally in a major key. Six is minor, seven is diminished. Yeah. For an alien cadence in a major key, you have major flat six, major, major flat seven, back to the one. And it has this like huge epic ending. Ba, 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 to the ending of a song, right? Uh, Jeff's, um, I just watched your reaction to uh, Jeff's White Christmas. And I just covered that also. At the very end, there's an alien cadence on there. Oh, there is. Exactly. I talked about it for a while. Yeah. And he yeah, does that, it in a cool and an interesting way. Yeah. Because um, his his voice, his solo goes down, but the other parts do like the more. Oh, no, they all they all kind of. Right. Isn't it like he goes. Bah, 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 and then like goes down. Yeah. The one. He goes from a um, let's see. Flat, five, six, flat seven. Then the lower one. Flat six, flat seven. It's a he goes from a D to an E flat to an F to an E flat to the thick G one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but I yeah. thought that was really cool. So Alien so. Cadence and then Picardy Third is when you have a major 
chord at the end of a minor piece. I mean, I've I've always thought that was cool. Love it. <clears throat> yeah, those are my two favorite things. <laughs> also, that back when you cover or you reacted to Jeff's "Ain't No Sunshine," yeah, you you brought attention to the um the the D chord that was in originally in the song that was in the key of C. So I thought that was mm. really cool. Also, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I thought that was awesome, but I just had to mention that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, you've pretty much answered all the questions at this point. Um, Wait. So we're just about to the end here. So is there is there anything that comes to mind that you would like to mention um, before we bring it to a close? This could be literally anything. Mm. Any questions, concerns? Open floor for both of us. No, I'm, I mean, it's almost almost two hours. I think we covered just about. Just <laughs> <laughs> it went a little bit longer this is going to be by far the longest podcast we've had so far but yeah. there's a lot of good info shared here today mm-hmm. definitely so um yeah that pretty much wraps it up for us um guys this has been the vocast with peter barber a very experienced and talented vocalist singer uh youtuber if you have not yet had the privilege of checking out his content go do it. He check him out, Peter Barber on YouTube. And also I will link some of his other links in the description as well. So we can go check him out. I can't talk about him enough. He's super talented and I plan to have him on at some point again for a touch base podcast. So yeah, I think that wraps it up. So um, I think we're going to bring this to a close. So this has been the vocast. I'm your host, Drew. We will see you guys next time. Take care of yourselves. Love you, mean it. Bye. Peace.